Good morning, my name is Kyle. It's my privilege to be one of the pastors here on staff and um, the primary teacher in this church. If you have a Bible and you're going to want one, if you have it, to t- open it up to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1 will be the first text we're dealing with, but we're going to deal with a swath of text, um, and so I want you to uh, have that with you if you don't. If you don't have a Bible, free one's in the back. Go grab one. And we're starting a new series today, and the series is on uh, work. And uh, in our community groups, it's, it's worth saying while you're um, turning there, it's our community groups also are going to be looking at this topic of work. And they've just started up, and so let me encourage you to get involved. If you don't have one, I'll be leading one at Silvio and Tara Vasquez's house on Wednesday evenings. You're welcome to come to that one or any of them. But we'd love to see you. We'd love for everyone to be involved in a community group. Well, today we're, we're going to talk about work. And I want to um, start in the beginning because it's a very good place to start. Genesis chapter 1, looking at verses 26 through 28. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Thus far, God's word. Let me pray for us. Lord, as we gather around your word now, we do pray that you would be at work. That you would be at work in our midst, making things anew. And that as your word goes forth, as Luke tells us, and it multiplies, that it would even be a fulfillment of this very text in our midst. For Christ's sake, we ask it. Amen. Well, work. Why talk about the subject of work? Uh, a lot of people wonder that, and especially why talk about it at church. Well, I suppose one reason to talk about it is because Uh, Most of us actually, the majority of us, spend at least 60% of our waking hours talking about work. I mean, it's a significant part of our life, but is it actually significant? Are the things that we do significant, and does it matter in our relationship with God? And what can the church, if anything, have to tell, tell us or teach us about work? I suppose most of the things that I learned about work, I actually learned um, outside the church growing up. Maybe the first place was my first concert. It was Mud Island on the mighty Mississippi River, and I was listening to the Bengals. Just another manic Monday. I wish it were Sunday. That's my fun day. Just another manic Monday. Some of you remember this. Or I go on, and then I would listen to, you know, Lover Boy. Everybody's working for the weekend. This is what taught me about work. I go on Huey Lewis in the news, and I would hear that everybody's working for a living, but it seems like at the end of the day, the paycheck is really not paying the bills. And we know that work can be a drudgery, as Sam Cooke sings, as everybody's working on the chain gang. All day long, they work so hard till the sun is going down, working on the highways and byways, wearing, wearing a frown. You hear them moan in their lives away, and then you hear somebody say, that's the sound of the men working on the chain gang. I was tempted to have you go, mm, 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 and then after a minute have you go, ah, 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 and I kind of, it would be beautiful, but I decided not to do that. It would be too much work, you know what I'm saying? (laughs) It would be too much work, and this is why Elvis Costello reminds us, welcome to the working week. I know it don't thrill you. I hope it don't kill you. Well, if that's what we have heard outside the church, what about inside the church? Well, I suppose one experience I had was when I was in England and a minister got up and and he basically told us that the only significant work in life was the work of ministry. And and then he said, uh, 
he reassured us all that we were all ministers. He was just a full-time minister, and we were part-time ministers insofar as the significant things that we did in life was that hour or two on Wednesday night when we set up chairs or um, on Sunday morning when we handed out bulletins. This was our ministry, or when we got part of an evangelism event, and that was the significant thing that we were doing in life because the rest of us, well, we had to work to put food on the table, and our work, that work was significant only so insofar as it paid for his salary, his work. Is that, is that the significance of work? Some of us maybe have that idea that our work really doesn't matter to God and God doesn't really matter to our work. But what I would like to suggest to you, my thesis is this, and this is what I'll be talking about and we'll be exploring for the next 10 or so weeks, is this, that actually all of your work matters to God and God matters to all of your work. And the Bible actually has a substantial, uh, substantial amount of stuff to say about work. And today I just want to introduce that by talking about an overview of the story of work. Uh, Wendell Berry once wrote, the significance and ultimately the quality of the work we do is determined by our understanding of the story in which we are taking part. And so what story are you living in? Today I want to tell you the, the, the story that the Bible tells, the true story, God's story of humanity, God's story of work. And we're going to do it in three parts. We're going to look at the, God's creation of work. We're going to look at our problem with work. And then finally, we're going to look at the Bible's promise about work. So first, God's creation of work. The text I read earlier in Genesis 1, uh, verses 26 through 28, tell us about the creation of work. And at first, we're introduced to the workers. Verse 26, let us make man in our image. Well, we're told it four times and in four different ways that humanity is created in the image and likeness of God. And while that's a big and beautiful subject, and I can't talk about all of it today, at least one thing that it means is that we were created to work. Because one of the things that we learn about God, one of the central things we learn about God in Genesis 1 and 2, is that God is a worker. Genesis 2, 2, God finished his work. God is a worker, and being created in his image means that he created us to work as well. That's why when we get to Genesis 2 and Genesis 2.15, it says, The Lord God took the man, he put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. That is that when you and I were created, God had work in mind. Yesterday, I was outside in the courtyard with my little daughter, two and a half, Neve, and our next door neighbor, um, he is about 20 months old. His name is Eli. And as they were outside, I noticed that Eli, he saw some leaves, and then he saw some berries, and they were on uh, the place where you can sit by the fountain. Um, what do you call that? A bench. A bench. He was, saw these things on the bench, and so then he's like, well, those don't belong on the bench. And so he started pushing them off of the bench. And as he's pushing them off the bench, then he, he decides that he needs to go upstairs to his house. So he goes upstairs to his house, and then he comes back, and he has two brooms, He's got another um, little sweeper thing. His mom is helping him with this, and he's got a sword, but he thinks it's a leaf blower. Okay. He goes, Whoo. and then Eli goes, and he starts pushing the leaves off of the sidewalk around our courtyard and all the little uh, berries and thistles, and so he's pushing them off. Why? Well, I'm sure he's doing that because he saw someone else do it like his parents. And he is reflecting them. But I think there's a deeper reason. I think Eli is doing it because he was made in the image of God. And God is a worker, and God orders, and God sorts things. That's what we see in Genesis 1, and that is what Eli was doing. And, and here's what this means. This actually challenges a lot of our assumptions about work, because I think most of us, well, we, we kind of go to work singing uh, what Pastor Tom Nelson uh, how he's rewritten the song, and he says, I owe, I owe, it's off to work I go. And that's how most of us think, right? Uh, work is something to get over, which is why we call Wednesday hump day, and we pine for retirement. But you see, what this text tells us is that actually 
Work is a dignity, not a drag. Because we were created in God's image. First and foremost, work is a dignity and not a drag. And moreover, this means that that if we don't work, to, to not work, to refuse to work, well, well, that's a fundamental violation and rebellion against God's created order. And the inability to work, which some of us have, that, that's not a triumph, that's a tragedy. And it, you should note that when I use the word work, as I did in that illustration, that, that when I say work, I'm not simply talking about paid occupation. I'm talking about all kinds of things that we're called to do in this world. In the Bible, work is, is more defined by contribution than compensation. And so that's what I mean when I say work. But we're introduced here to the workers, but we're also introduced to the work itself. Look at verse 26. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let him have dominion. And then we're told about it again in verse 28. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion. That is, that, that Adam and Eve were called to be kings, to rule, to this work of ruling, to having dominion. Dominion over what? Well, we're told, verses 26 and 28 repeat it, over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Now, when it talks about the sea and the heavens and the earth, what it's saying is everything. It's a literary device, like I work night and day. It means I work all the time. It, we're to have dominion over everything. And the first way in which, consider this, that dominion is expressed is what? As gardeners. As gardeners, look in chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2 verse 8 says, The Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And then 2 verse 15 says, God put Adam in the garden to work it and to keep it. Now, let's just stop right there. A garden, a gardener. What do gardeners do? Well, well gardeners, they, they cultivate the ground. They bring out its latent potential. They order it in such a way that it flourishes. And that means that when the Bible talks about dominion, it does not mean domination or exploitation. But it actually means that we care for and develop and enjoy the world in God-honoring ways. That's what our call is to do in this world. This is the beginning of culture. But where did the garden come from? Do you notice that? Genesis 2 verse 8, God planted a garden. God planted the garden. A garden, though, is not the wilderness. A garden is not just nature. A garden is actually cultivated nature. That means that God started the work of cultivating the earth and then he puts Adam in there and he says, I want you to carry on. I want you to carry on what I've done. I want you to expand what I've done. I want you to care for and keep. But Adam wasn't just supposed to stay there in the garden in Eden. Verse 28, be fruitful and multiply of chapter 1. Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. You see, if you understand the geography of Genesis right, uh, the garden is not of Eden. The garden is in Eden. And when it says the garden is of Eden, it's because there is a garden in Eden. That is, God took a little part of Eden and he started cultivating it. But there are other lands, too, that we find out about. And, and Adam was called to take this garden, this, this little cultivated bit, and to expand that, to expand the borders of the garden throughout the whole earth. Fill the earth and subdue it. There's a pastor in Charlottesville, Virginia, named Greg Thompson. He's some of you's former pastor. And Greg tells a story about how when he was young, his dad, Bruce, was a handyman and a craftsman. And he did projects on Saturday morning around the house. And Greg, instead of watching football with his brothers, would often work with his father. Well, Bruce had a hammer, and in that hammer, it had the initials BT in it, Bruce Thompson. Well, one day, Greg walked into his dad's workshop, and he saw another hammer by his father's hammer. And there were initials in it, GT, Greg Thompson. And Greg talks about how the hammer that his dad laid there was an invitation. 
And it was an assurance that his participation in his father's work was not only tolerated but desired, not only desired but anticipated, not only anticipated but provided for. And you see, when God, he makes this garden, it's like a hammer. And God says, come on, I want you to participate in my work. I want you to come along. And it's not only an invitation, it's an assurance that this participation is not only tolerated but desired, not only desired but anticipated, not only anticipated but provided for. See, God has called us to participate in his work of ruling the world. We are governors, managers, little stewards, little kings who on behalf of God rule and reign and represent God to the world in God-honoring ways. This is why Psalm 8.4 that was read earlier says, What is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him, and yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him, it's king language, with glory and honor, and given him dominion over the works of your hands, you have put all things under his feet. You see, God's original intention was to rule the world through humanity. That's how God intended to rule the world. Uh, Nobody has perhaps um, thought about this in more interesting ways and carried out its conclusions better than Martin Luther, the German reformer. And Luther, on reflecting on the Psalms and how the Psalms will often thank God for securing the gates of the city, uh, Luther reflecting on it, he says, yeah, wait, wait a second. But how are the gates of the city secure? Well, they're secure by welders and builders making gates. And they're secure by the, the people that work there, the, the armies that stand there and secure the city. That, that is that God doesn't do this by fiat. God does this through people. And Luther then carries that out, and he says, wait, so in everything, in everything, God is doing this. Let me quote him. He says, God could easily give you grain and fruit without your plowing and planting, but he does not want to do so. What else is all our work to God, whether in the fields or in the garden, in the city or in the house, in war or in government, but just such child's performance? by which he wants to give his gifts in the fields, at home, and everywhere else. Our work, Luther says, these are the mask of God, behind which he wants to remain concealed and do all things. And then Luther concludes, in all our doing, he is to work through us, and he alone shall have glory from it. Do you hear what he's saying? Here's what he's saying. He's saying this, you know, God could just create a new person. He did it in the very beginning. But he actually uses us to do so, so that when we have children, that is God bringing life into the world. Or think of it like this. When when we build houses, when you build a house, that is God providing shelter for someone. Or, Or think about it like this. When you stock groceries, or when you as a clerk check someone out, that is God providing daily bread. These are the masks of God through which he intends to rule the world and spread his gifts around. This is our calling and work. And notice what he does before he sends them out. Genesis chapter 1 verse 28, did you see it? And he blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply. He blessed them. You know what blessing is? As we look in the Bible, especially at the Aaronic benediction and numbers and places like that, when God blesses someone, he's extending his presence to them. He's saying, I am with you and I'm going to go with you. You see, close readers of Genesis, and especially those who have studied the rest of the Bible, will tell you, and we looked at this in the Exodus series, that that the Garden of Eden reflects and has a lot of similarity with Israel's sanctuary. That Israel's sanctuary in the Garden of Eden, they they look the same. And the more you study in the whole of the Bible, in the canonical context, the more you see that Eden was actually depicted as a sanctuary. This was the Holy of Holies. This was the place where God's presence dwelt. But you see, when, when, when he blesses them and he says, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, he's saying, I want you to extend 
the borders of this sanctuary. I want you to fill and expand my presence, my glory, my Shekinah to the whole of the earth. And this is why, for instance, Habakkuk 2.14 promises that the earth will be full of the knowledge and the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. But you know how God initially intended to do that? Through our work. Through our work. Fill the earth. Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Now this is, means this is, has extreme, gives our work extreme value and extreme dignity. But let's be honest. For most of us, our work does not feel like that at all. Why? Well, that brings us to the second point, our problem with work. It, we all experience, even in the best jobs, that, that the, the, the idyllic presentation that we see in Genesis 1 and 2, our experience just doesn't match it. Even in the best jobs, we know that our work is not what it ought to be, what it could be, what it should be. Why? Well, Genesis 3 tells us. You see, Adam and Eve, they were kings and they were also priests to expand, to mediate God's presence in the world. And, and one of the things that, uh, and they were gardeners. And one of the things a gardener's to do is a gardener is to protect the garden, to root out anything in the garden that might threaten to uh, damage or destroy that garden. Think of it like this. If you're a gardener and there are moles, you have to get those moles out of the garden. And if you don't crush the moles, if you don't get them out of the garden, then what's going to happen is eventually they're going to tear up the root system of your garden so that the plants can no longer grow and flourish. Well, for Adam, it wasn't a mole. It was a snake. For Adam and Eve, it wasn't a mole. It was a snake. And that snake came into the garden and instead of crushing the snake, they colluded with the snake. You see, priests, priests were also supposed to protect the sanctuary. That's why Phineas is the one who protects the sanctuary from anything unclean, anything unholy. Adam, as a priest, a king, he's to protect God's garden sanctuary, but he doesn't. No, he works with the snake rather than against it. Instead of crushing the snake, he colludes with the snake. And because of that, sin enters the world. And when sin enters the world, it affects every aspect of our work. Our work relationships are strained. It was interesting. The kids started off great. They were there sweeping all the berries off of the sidewalk, and they were knocking the leaves off until they started hitting one another with their tools because they were so upset that one had this kind of broom and the other had this kind of broom, and then they're wanting to get one another's brooms and... It, some of the most difficult experiences at work can be strained work relationships. But you know, the first office that had two employees and they were both blaming one another on their problems and talking behind the boss's back. Work relationships are strained, not just with one another, but also with God. Verse 3, 8 says that instead of basking in the glory of God's presence, in his blessing presence, that Adam and Eve had a propensity to hide from him. And when you cut God out, out of the picture, what happens is work starts becoming pointless, meaningless, without purpose, vanity, vanity. All is vanity, the author of Ecclesiastes says. And also, it either becomes pointless or it becomes the point. Instead of worshiping and glorifying and enjoying God through our work, we worship our work. We derive our significance and value from it. It becomes... Not a means to an end, but it becomes the ultimate thing. And it's not, just that, it's not just that our work relationships are strained. Also, the work environment we read becomes very inhospitable. Look at Genesis 3.23. It says that God sent him out of the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he, came, he was taken. See, Adam was created outside of the garden in a barren place. And God puts him in the garden. And now he's back into that inhospitable environment. We read about it as well in chapter 3 verses 13, I mean 17 and 19. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles that shall bring forth for you, you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. In other words, what's described here is that what once came with ease and pleasure is now painful and difficult and frustrating, 
and burdensome, and we all know that experience. You've been working for a long time on a project, and the computer crashes. Or you, there's no rain, and the crops won't grow. You, you, just, you just bought a week's worth of groceries, and you came home and put them in the refrigerator, and the electricity goes out for 12 hours. You spent years working on a degree, and when you get out, you find that the job market is completely saturated. Uh, you find a job that you love, but in doing that job, it's, you're starting to become injured physically, back pain, carpal tunnel, your eyes, and you can no longer do it. You come up with this great idea to insulate houses, and then you find out that it gives people lung cancer. This is work in a fallen world. This is the curse. And we as Christians need to realize that this is, this is part of it. And that gives us a realistic understanding of work because it means this, that we know that any work and every work and even the best jobs is never going to be completely satisfying. Never, ever, ever. And it also means this, that, that all of our work and all that we do, it's always going to fall short of God's intentions. It will always fall short of the glory of God. And so as we fill the earth and subdue the earth and such, even in doing that, we know that, that the knowledge and glory of God covering the earth as the water covers the sea, that that is not going to come anymore simply by our work. It can't. Not in this cursed state. And yet, the Bible says that while our image has been marred, our image is not lost. And so we still can work in God-honoring ways, and in ways that even, even if they don't reach God's intentions, his original intentions, they still work towards them. Well, thankfully, this is not the end of the story. We actually had the end of the story, you know. We have the end of the story. In the book of Revelation, chapter 5, I want you to turn there. Turn to Revelation, chapter 5. As we come to the third point, the final point, and that is God's promise about work. The book of Revelation chapter 5, we see this scene. It was read for us earlier, and in that scene, we have the throne room of God. And around the throne room of God, there are uh, many people and many creatures, and they are singing praises to the Lamb. And listen to the song that they sing. This is Revelation 5, verses 9 and 10. And they sang a new song, saying... Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and every language and people and nation, and you have made them a kingdom and priest to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Did you hear it? This picture that we're given here, this picture of the throne room of God, this picture of the song, it is a picture of God restoring to humans their kingly and priestly role, a kingdom and a priest. And notice, they shall reign, where? On the earth. And so at the end of Revelation, in Revelation 22, 5, it says that the servants of God will reign forever and ever. And you know what another word for reign is? Dominion, rule, See, it's a return to Genesis. It's a return to the initial task. And so here's what that means. You know, when I was younger, I, 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 was, uh, I was working during the summers in a factory making mattresses in Memphis. And, um, and they didn't have air conditioning. And in Memphis humidity over 100 degrees, I was sweating a lot. And as I was there sweating, I just kept thinking, man, I can't wait for heaven when I don't have to work. You ever thought that? But I think that this suggests something very different. This suggests that in heaven, we actually will be working. That we'll, we, we will be working, though our work will be different. And it won't be by the spread, sweat of our brow. We will be working in heaven forever and ever and ever. But what will it be like? I was, um, after Holy Week and Easter, that's a pretty big week for us, we have a couple of days off, and I went down to Fuller's Library, 
And I went down to Fuller's Library, and after a good night's sleep, I got up early in the morning, drove um, against L.A. traffic. I got to Fuller's Library, and I went down to the basement, and I opened up books, and I got to tell you, it was one of the best days I've had in a long time. I just read and read and read and read, and I was researching the Dead Sea Scrolls, and I was having fun, and it was exciting, and I worked for 13 hours straight, just worked and worked and worked and worked, and I was loving it, and it was productive, and I was getting it, and you're thinking, you are crazy. I know. You weren't made the same way I was. I was made this way, but here's my point. What will heaven be like? Well, I think it'll be something like that. And days two and three didn't look like that, but that day looked like that. And we've all had those moments, those hours, those half days, those days, those projects where where we found our work to be satisfying, to be unhindered, to be energizing and life-giving. John Owen, a Puritan pastor and theologian, said, No man ought to look for anything in heaven but what one way or another he hath some experience of in this life. And I've had some experience of good work. I know what heaven will be like. Can you imagine it? That is what we're talking about. That is the picture Revelation presents. But how do we get there? How do we get there? Because we're a long way from there. Genesis 3 is a long way from there. Right now is a long way. How do we get there? Well, there's this expectation that starts developing amongst the people of Israel. And the expectation is simply this, that that God once again would reestablish his reign through humanity. Yes, God reigns and God always reigns. But he would once again establish his reign, the reign that was lost in Adam and Eve. He would reestablish that through humanity. And that expectation started, it started um, centering around a couple of kind of figures. Uh, One was their king. That's why the throne of David is also called the throne of Yahweh, the throne of God. 1 Chronicles 28, 5. 2 Chronicles 9, 8. And so the, in Psalm 80, 17, for instance, they pray this prayer in song. But let your hand be on the man of your right hand, the son of man whom you have made strong for yourself. Uh, they are calling for, uh, it's a prayer that God would once again rule through their king, this great king who they called the Messiah. But, but did you hear that, that phrase, the son of man? The son of man. Son of man is an interesting phrase. We read it earlier, Psalm 8, 4, what is man that thou art mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him. And, and in the Bible, the phrase son of man, it means a, a paradigmatic human. An ideal human. Humanity as representative and humanity as it was supposed to be. This is why Ezekiel in the book of Ezekiel continues to call himself the son of man. Because he represents what humanity should look like in that book. A spirit inhabited humanity. But there's another place. Can you think of anywhere else that the phrase son of man is used? The son of man. When the book of Daniel chapter 7 Daniel's given this vision of one like the Son of Man. And that man is given dominion and glory and a kingdom. So here's the question. Who is that man? Who is the Son of Man? Who is the one who's going to rule from David's throne? Who is the one through whom God is going to reestablish his reign through humanity on earth? Well, Hebrews chapter 2 gives us the answer. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 5 through 8, in a text that is talking about Jesus, says this, But it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere. It's like he forgot the text. What is man that you are mindful of him? And the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor and putting everything in subjection under his feet. And then the commentary. Now in putting everything in subjection to him, that is Christ, he left nothing outside his control. Do do you see what the author of Hebrews is saying? He's saying that, that Psalm 8 is about Jesus. That Jesus is the one through whom God will rule and reign. That Jesus is the one through whom God will 
once again establish his rule through humanity. That, that he is great David's greater son. That he is the son of man. That he is the second Adam. That he is the image and the glory of God. And God is going to reestablish his reign through him because he is fully human as well as fully God. But wait a second, Kyle. Psalm 8 is about Jesus? I thought Psalm 8 was about all of us. I thought Psalm 8 was about humanity. Yes, humanity as it's supposed to be. Humanity as God created it to be. And if you want to find out what humanity looks like as it's supposed to be, as it's created to be, don't look around, look at Jesus. He is the Son of Man. And yet, and yet, that doesn't leave us out of the picture you see, because in Daniel 7, after it talks about the Son of Man coming in to the throne of God and receiving all glory and dominion and power, it then goes on to say that the saints of the Most High will also obtain this Son's everlasting dominion. And in Romans 8, it tells us that, that we who are in union with Christ, who is the very image of God, that we who are in union with Christ, that we are co-heirs with Christ, by that union. And to be an heir, is that's to come into possession of, to come into authority. And Ephesians 2, 6, this is why it says that we are already seated with Christ in union with him in the heavenly places. And so Revelation 1, 6 can say that he has already made us a kingdom and priest to God. That is, that in union with him, our image, the image of God in us that's been marred, is being restored. And so, we are in this process, this process of, of through becoming conformed to Christ, this process of coming back into and experiencing the image as it was meant to be experienced. And as it was meant to be experienced includes our work. It's very much tied to our work. And God made them in his image, and he said, let them have dominion. Wynton Marsalis was a, is a uh, phenomenal trumpet player, and one night he was in New York City, and he was playing uh, by himself, uh, unaccompanied, his song, I Don't Stand a Ghost of a Chance with You. And as he got to the end of the song, he came to the final notes, and he let each one ring out a little bit more longer each time. As he got to the climax and the end of the song, and then right when the climax was going to happen, a cell phone goes off. Magic ruined. People started picking up their glasses and drinking and walking out of the hall and talking. And, and it was all just kind of, and he didn't know what to do. He was standing there. And as he paused there, then he began to play. He began to play, actually, the exact ringtone of the cell phone. And then he began to improvise off of that. And after about two or three minutes, he, he began two or three key changes and a tempo change. He brought it back down around to where he was on that last note, right where he left off. You see, he was not willing to give up on the song. And everybody saw this creativity, this work, this brilliance, and they gave him a standing ovation. They gave him a standing ovation, and they said, this is amazing. Anybody who was there, that, it, it's almost like they were glad the cell phone went off because through that he was able to show his handiwork and his creativity. And God has not given up on his song. God has not given up on his plan. God has not given up on his original purpose that through us he would reign, that he would reign through his image bearers. Image bearers like you and me, he would fill the earth and that we would fill the earth and bring glory to him by enjoying him through and in our work. This is what God is doing by restoring the image in us. And this is his purpose for all eternity. And this is why we're spending time to study work and vocation. Because it's central to the beginning of the story and it's central to the end of the story and we see it all the way between. And one of the things it means to be remade after Christ and to have the image restored in us is to understand more of our calling 
to subdue the earth, to rule, to work, paid and unpaid in all kinds of ways. And and so what we're going to do is we're going to spend time on that, and we also want to give you examples of that, of people in every atmosphere, in every place, in the regular workaday world, just trying to love God and love their neighbors through their work who've thought about this and understand the call of God upon their lives and are seeking to to be fashioned after the image of Christ in their workplace. So after I pray, we're going to have one of those. Tom Beveridge is going to come up and give us a testimony, a story, an example, because because you need multiple examples, and I can't give you uh, I can't give you examples for my life because I've got one job. Uh, so you want to hear from, from different people, and we want to honor different people in different spheres to see what they're doing and how they're bearing God's image and loving him and loving others. Let me pray for us. Lord, we thank you that you did not give up on us, that while you created us in your image and while you did not by your common grace let that image uh, completely fall into to total ruin. Nevertheless, Lord, you took on the image yourself in the person of Jesus Christ and through him who smote the serpent, who crushed his head, and in union with him you were restoring to us our original task of being kings and priests to you. Lord, help us to do that and understand what it means in every area of our life. For your glory, we ask it, that the earth might be full, that the earth might be full of your knowledge and your glory. Amen.